I'll, I'll kick things off. We still got people filtering in, um, but I'm delighted um, to welcome you to the next instalment of our conversations with strategy. We're um, delighted to have another distinguished visiting fellow with us today. And um, just to give those of you who haven't been to any of these events before, just a bit of a background. What we do in these events is put one of our, um, one of our, one of our visiting fellows, often from the world of or politics or government, um, or in, in this case, from, um, from the think tank world, um, in conversation with one of, our, um, one of our academics, and ideally to have a, a great conversation about their careers, but also about the sort of issues that are going on in the world that may be of interest to you. So we're delighted to have with us today, uh, Professor Michael Clark and uh, Professor John Gearson. And so I will hand over to John to, uh, to, to begin uh, the conversation. Thank you to both of them. Well, thanks very much, Charlie. And uh, yeah, it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome Michael Clark um, back to uh, his, uh, his, his former home, um, of which he, didn't, he never really left. Um, a, uh, a very important figure for the department, uh, the school now, and, and, and for me personally, uh, because it was, it was Mike's uh, role of setting up the Centre for Defence Studies uh, in 1990, which, which I now direct, uh, and therefore in, in many respects, you know, certainly not filling his shoes, but clump around loosely in, in the big shoes that, that Mike uh, came before. Um, but today's about um, talking about Mike's career, and experience across the, I think we can call it the political military uh, debate, security studies, academic, but as Charlie said, also the think tank world, um, where for the first time ever, the uh, Royal United Services Institution Institute, as they now call themselves, um, appointed a non-military uh, director in, 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 the, in the form of Mike Clark in 2007, where he served with distinction until 2015 as director general. The, the CV that Mike has is, uh, would take up the hour to go through the prestigious uh, roles and, 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 and things he's done. But if I just do a couple of, of highlights to give you an idea of a, of a, of a security studies uh, uh, career, um, Mike went, as many of us did, including me, to, uh, to the Department of International Politics at um, Aberystwyth, University of Wales, where he did an in BSc in International Politics and was later a research officer there at ABBA at a time when uh, war studies um, didn't, uh, didn't admit undergraduates. Uh, it, was a, it was a postgraduate degree um, at, at the time. And, and many of us uh, also learned about strategic studies uh, at Aberystwyth. Mike had posts in Manchester, Newcastle upon, uh, uh, upon line. And uh, as I said, in 1990 came to King's College where he was the founding director of the Centre for Defence Studies, later led the International Policy Institute at King's College, became head of the school, as it was then called, of social science and public policy in 2004, now a faculty, as you all know, um, and ended his career at King's College as deputy vice principal for research development uh, at King's. Mike is a fellow of, uh, of King's College uh, as well, but that doesn't really tell you about how, if there's been a, a commission, a panel, uh, any consideration of, of military, political, security studies uh, in the United Kingdom um, over the last 30 years, you will find that Mike was one of the members of, or was advising the people doing it. I mean, he spent a number of years as an advisor to the uh, uh, Defence Committee of the House of Commons, um, and also um, at the moment, the parliamentary uh, Joint National Committee on National Security Strategy, which is which he still serves in. Um, Mike, uh, let's start off. What, what led you to want to go and do international politics? If we start at that sort of formative phase, um, you mentioned to me that you were thinking about doing PPE in in Take a Breath. Yes, well, um, yeah, look, it's a great pleasure to speak to you, John, and to uh, say hello to everybody who's out there. It's <clears throat> because I have no idea who's out there. I'm just sort of speaking to a blank wall. And somebody once said to me, that's good preparation for talking to first year students. Um, just sort of talk and see what see what happens. But it's a great pleasure to, to, to do this. Um, 
I went to Aberystwyth because I didn't choose it, they chose me. I had a very um, checkered school career, so I went to a secondary modern school and then I transferred to a comprehensive. I didn't have any O-levels. Um, when my A-levels came out, they were better than anyone expected, including me. And having been rejected by all of my choices, I just got, in those days, it was six. Uh, I got six straight rejections. Um, but then Aberystwyth suddenly had a waiting list and they, they rang me up. Um, and somebody that you will remember, Robbie Pennell, who was the admissions tutor in those days at Aberystwyth, I got a call from him and he said, there is a place um, on the first year foundation course doing PPE if you would like to come, young man. And so at a week's notice, I went. Um, it was wonderful. And university education at Aber simply changed my life fundamentally and forever. Um, and in that first year, that foundation course, which, is, which I did enjoy, I thought that international politics was the, the best thing to do thereafter. So I transferred to that in the second year and thoroughly enjoyed it. And I became a devotee of academic work and, and international politics in particular as a result of that experience. I mean, Avarice was uh, trained a lot of people who have, have influenced what goes on at King's and, and in, in, influenced this area of, of, of research. Um, you made a move into the think tank world uh, and also um, education. Um, how difficult were, there, were those decisions at the time? Uh, I mean, the opportunity, the expansion of our, of our world has been pretty much, you know, alongside your career, frankly. You, you, you've been present in a huge expansion of opportunities and, and, and activities in this. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, the early part of my career was spent as a, uh, a research officer and then as a, a temporary lecturer and then as a, a full time lecturer. So I was I was doing the standard job as a lecturer in international relations, doing a lot of teaching. Um, I, at one time, I, I used to do half a term where I, I taught for over 20 hours a week um, for about five weeks. And that was absolutely exhausting. Um, you know, preparing 20 hours of material a week. Um, so I did a great deal of teaching in my early part of the, in the early part of my career, which turned out to be a great boon because it helps you understand material. It's, it's, it's great to, to teach intensively, at least for a, a short period, which um, I did for a, a few years. But then this opportunity came up in 1990 when Laurie Friedman, um, Professor of War Studies at King's, won the Ministry of Defence contract to establish this Center for Defense Studies. And I would worked with Laurie a little bit on the Political Studies Association and I'd been a conference organizer and, and, uh, and he rang me up and he said, would you like to apply for this role as the first director of the center? And I was bowled over by the, the thought of it, by the offer of it. It was equivalent to a senior lectureship. Um, and I didn't hesitate for a moment at the idea of transferring from being a standard uh, lecturer to this new role that was only guaranteed for the first five years. Um, because I thought, whatever else I'm gonna do in my life, I, I've got to, I want to give this a try. It never occurred to me not to give it a go. I mean, there was a little sort of voice in the back of my mind to say, look, this may not work out, of course. Um, it may not be, funding may not be continued. You may be out on, you might be out on your ear. But to be honest, I thought the, the risk of that was well worth taking for the opportunity. And so um, I, I came to King's, uh, my, I started my job on the 1st of August, 1990. And on the 2nd of August, 1990, Saddam invaded Kuwait. Remember that? And I had three bank offices in the uh, in the Norfolk building, just empty offices, nothing at all, just some carpet. But in one of the offices was a telephone plugged in on the floor. And on the 2nd of August, the phone started ringing. So I picked the phone up and the voice said, this is the BBC. Um, is that the Centre for Defence Studies? And I said, oh, yes. And he said, are you following this 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 attack on Kuwait that's just been launched from Iraq? And I said, oh, yes, we're doing a lot on that. And he said, oh, right, you're right. They're just the man to, to talk to. And immediately nothing to work on three blank offices we were plunged into the Iraq war it turned out to be very very lucky from my point of view I didn't get I didn't get a, a full night's sleep for the next six months but it got the CDS going in exactly the way you would want it to suddenly everybody knew that there was a thing at King's called the Centre for Defence Studies even though at the time we didn't have any furniture didn't have any other staff for about a month and so on. In fact it's interesting um, because you'll know very well that Laurie Friedman had a very similar experience that I think it was his second or third day that the Falklands were invaded. That's right. And, uh, and, and, and the premier nuclear strategy theorist 
uh, in Britain became an expert on expeditionary warfare. Yeah. Um, You've got to, I mean, there, there is a, a sort of career thing here. I mean, you know, we, you, Richie Benno was a great Australian cricket captain, was always being asked, what's the secret, Richie? What's the secret to being a, 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 a captain? And he said, it's 90% luck and 10% uh, effort, 10% talent, but don't try it unless you've got the 10%. And what that really means is that you've got to have the basics. You've got to be good at what you do, but there is a way in which you you exploit your good luck as much as you possibly can, and you ride your bad luck. And there's lots of bad luck, of course, but you learn how to ride the bad luck and ruthlessly exploit the good luck if you've got the ten percent that is required as the basis for delivering the goods, whatever they may be. So, was was this the first occasion that you had to work very closely with? Um, the Ministry of Defence, uh, the military, because they obviously were the chief funders. How, how was the? How were those early years, and how was that experience for you? That was pretty good. I, I, as it happens, I'd worked with the military a fair bit before, um, from being a student. Actually, that was more by luck, by coincidence than anything else. I've always interacted with the military just because of the subjects that I did, and the things I used to do when I was at Manchester and, and then at Newcastle. But this role at King's as the director of the Centre for Defence Studies, and as you know, involves a lot of close relationship with um, the civil service in the MOD and with the military themselves. And I found it, it's a very easy relationship as long as you're straightforward. Um, I mean, the military are extremely polite. They're, they're easy to get along with. And civil servants in the Ministry of Defence, I've always found are very easy to chat to. Bain, essentially, I think they're slightly embarrassed by what they do. So they're very nice about it. Whereas there are civil servants in other parts of Whitehall um, who are, are full of the moral the moral um, push of, of what they do. And they're rather, um, uh, can be rather arrogant about it. So I found the Ministry of Defence were very easy to, to get on with. As long as you're, you, you, as it were, summarise what your problems are or what you're what you're offering really uh, straightforwardly. And the MOD really wanted this to work. So when we got overwhelmed with work in the first 18 months, and we it was a little team of us, there were only three of us, I think, at the time, uh, they, they seconded somebody from MOD to help with the admin. And that was a real boost. It, it gave us a, an administrative officer, as well as a sort of a departmental secretary, which released my time and the time of our two researchers um, to, to go out and, and, and build the reputation. And we created this image that the Centre for Defence Studies was much bigger than it really was. And uh, I mean, eventually it ended up with about 30 odd people, but it started as, as myself and half of two others. And of course you were closely aligned with the War Studies Department. In, in yes. <clears throat> and there's always, a, 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 and also um, with the International Relations Department at LSE to begin with for the first five years, we were meant to be in between both departments. But the, the backing of the War Studies Department was fundamental to making the CDS work. And that's been one of the, the elements of King's, War Studies at King's. It's always, since Laurie has been involved with it, Laurie Friedman, when he became Professor of War Studies in 1982, almost from the very beginning, he made War Studies entrepreneurial. And so, as well as having this solid research base that brings good people into it, both as, on staff and students, and they are, they are good, unquestionably, there is also this entrepreneurial element, which always looks for opportunities to create new things, new organizations, new arrangements. It gets messy, and sometimes the college doesn't like the messiness of it. You know, Laurie and I both lived through that the pressure we used to get from central administration about how messy some of our relationships were. But our relationships with outside bodies and with funding and so on, they were always productive, always productive. I think the, uh, the the challenge of being a think tank within a within a university presents some 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 challenge some well some some issues. I mean, you've talked about entrepreneurship, of course, which I suppose think tanks have to be. Um, it doesn't always sit well with with as you say your university bureaucracy, and that must affect our, our our junior colleagues and and the students to some extent. These are two different worlds in some ways. Yeah, the, I mean, I think the relationship is a lot better now than it was because universities have have realized and have embraced the, the need to be more entrepreneurial and the research excellence framework, the old RAE as it was, a research assessment exercise, um, as it were, came round with, with it, each iteration, they came round to a greater recognition of the end product of academic work, that it's, I mean, academic work is justified in its own terms, and that's absolutely right. But if it's also got a customer out there, and if that customer is government or industry, um, then that's even better. And that, that end user 
application, I think, as something which universities have taken a greater interest in. And so there's, there's, there's much uh, more toleration now for the sort of messy organizations that you, know, you and I are very familiar with and that Laurie was a great entrepreneur for. Somebody once said to me, he said that, that mentioning another director in London, he said that so-and-so, he said, casts a long shadow and the staff never really emerge from it. Whereas Laurie Friedman has got green fingers. He just knows how to plant things and let them grow. And you've got to be prepared then to create structures which are flexible enough to be able to do that. So I think the situation is better, but it can always improve, that's for sure, because universities themselves are under great pressure. Um, we're going to be celebrating the, uh, the anniversary of the establishment of the department uh, um, um, in, in, the, in the near future. But of course, you, you were here and this, this time was, was a period of the, the huge expansion as the department, which had still been quite small in the late 1980s, uh, it had a huge uh, expansion in the 1990s and in, into the 2000s, and, and and here we are today with 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 a school um, and 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 two enormous departments as well as research institutes. Yeah, I think it was uh, it was 10, 11 people when I when, when I joined, and I wasn't I wasn't in the department. I was supported by it, but my job was to be the director of this new centre, which was shared at the time with LSE. And so, although I was you know physically in the same sort of place. The department and I were slightly separate, um, but it was, I think it was about 11 people at the time. And, and before that, I mean, before I joined, it had been four people, I think, uh, one time. So obviously you're dealing with the, uh, with the Ministry of Defence, you're dealing with um, the armed forces uh, to, to, uh, to a large extent. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm jumping ahead a bit and perhaps we'll, we'll go back to uh, uh, Kings as well, but um, I want to sort of try and explore just what a big change, how extraordinary it was, if I may put it that way, that um, not that you, but that a non-military person um, was chosen to, to lead uh, the, the, the principal military studies think tank in, in the UK. And obviously we're a much smaller field than America where there are, there are multiples. I mean, one of the, you know, the, the two, maybe three big name um, um, think tanks in Britain. Yeah, I mean, RUSI, Royal United Service Institute, is the oldest surviving security think tank in the world. It goes back to uh, 1831, established, I mean, Kings was established in 1829 by the Duke of Wellington. RUSI was established in 1831 by the Duke of Wellington. So, we, you know, we share a, a common heritage in that respect. But it had always been a, a, a think tank for the military for military thinking. It was always designed to help the military to think more carefully about their own profession. Um, and it, it, it had never quite fitted in to the more modern think tank uh, niches um, in the 50s and 60s and 70s. And my predecessor, Admiral Richard Cobble, did a very good job in creating um, a, a much more broadly based uh, think tank. But the view that the uh, the, the, the board took, the Council of Rusi, when they approached me about it, was they said that they, they want a professional research director rather than an, an ex-military person who, who can do it. They want a professional research director who can maybe take it to a different level. So that was, in a way, my, my task, which to come to Rusi. And it was a bit like change management. I mean, it was a very good organisation when I took it over and I paid tribute to my predecessor in that respect, very strong tribute. But it was a bit like change management. You had to look at all areas of the, of the organization say what needs to change where do we need to get to in five years so the first thing we did was draw up a five-year plan a strategic plan for five years and then the thing i learned about change is that when you're when you're the boss and you're trying to create change you've got to do the detail and you've got to stick with it it's no good just announcing a lot of targets and send everybody off to achieve those targets You've got to do the detail, sweat the detail, so that change becomes built in to the momentum of the organization. And we worked very hard in those first two or three years. And it was very, I mean, it was simple in a way. We've got to, first of all, improve the quality of the research, just make it better, uh, iron out any problems, make sure that it's properly proofread, that it's properly presented, rebrand so that it looks more modern, not, not less military, but more modern. So the fairly obvious things we had to do. And then we had to break down internal silos. And I took a lot of the King's experience with me, both in 
uh, working in clusters rather than departments, let people cluster together to get whatever the job is that's done. It doesn't matter which department they sit in, it's what expertise they have. And also expertise in raising money, raising research money. So I was able to take a lot of my King's experience and apply it to change management in Rusty until we, uh, we won the Think Tank of the Year Award in uh, 2009, I think it was. And then we won three awards in four years. Um, which I was very proud about. So how was the, uh, as, as a category, not individuals, uh, was the difference between the researchers you led at CDS and the, and the researchers you had at RUSI? Some were civilian, some were military, some had just had service. I mean, how did you face, how did you deal with, 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 with that quite big change? As you say, a historically uh, prestigious organisation dominated by the military, but wanted to be relevant in the... Uh, well, in the yeah, the, the first thing I noticed, actually, there were some differences. The first thing I noticed is that when I went to Rusi, um, I'd have a meeting with the staff and they'd say, we've got this, this and this. And I'd say, OK, well, I think what we ought to do is the following one, two and three. And they went off and did it. And I thought gosh, you don't want to have a committee about it? No, it hasn't, be, hasn't got to be put through some huge bureaucracy. And I couldn't believe that they came back in a week's time and said, okay, we've done that, boss, what, what's next? And there was, that, there was that sense that was wonderful of this, it was a fairly small club and we could be friends and we could, we could make things happen. That was, that was lovely. But, and universities can't work that way because they're bigger organizations and they've got other issues. So there, there, there was that. But then I used to say to, as we recruited more researchers and we pushed outwards into different subject areas, and I used to say to them, look, this is not a university department, um, which means that, that you've got to be as good as if you're in a university department. As a rule of thumb, I used to say that, you know, if you would not get onto the shortlist for King's or LSE or Aberystwyth or Manchester or Oxbridge, if you wouldn't be shortlisted for a job there, we shouldn't be shortlisting you for a job uh, at Rusi. Um, you've got to be that good. But your job as a researcher is to be is to occupy that grey area. This is where policy analysts. So you've got to understand the academic research and be able to put it into the sort of terms that policy people understand in, in ways that is relevant to the military or to the or to politicians or leaders. And equally, you've got to understand how leaders have to react. You've got to know a bit about the, the difficulties of making policy, the dynamics of real policy making, and let people in the academic world understand that. So you're, you're, you're a translation mechanism. Now, in America, there are many people and many organizations that do that. I mean, America is the great, uh, the great, has a great plethora of think tanks, but there aren't that many in the UK. So there weren't many of us who could say we are policy analysts. We stand beside or in between the academic world on the one side, the policy world on the other. And I used to say, look, it's a privileged position to be in. And we are, you know, I, say, I used to say to the young researchers, we are working you like dogs. But believe me, you'll look back on this as the best part of your career because you're right in the middle of Whitehall. You're right in the middle of things when, when you know, when the world is collapsing around you, when, uh, when you know, Britain's going through traumas over whether it be Brexit or before that over the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, you're right in the middle of it. And so you work yourself very hard because you'll never be in as privileged a position as you are now to do something very interesting and actually rather important. Is it analogous to the um, the, research, the research department in, in the Foreign Office, where they, they recruit the academically trained researchers to, to do some of that, in, obviously for internal purposes? Yeah, it is a bit, but the, the, but the benefit is that you don't have to please the government. Um, and you don't you certainly don't, uh, at RUSI, and our kings at the CDS, um, you don't have to um, as we take a, an official line on anything. I used to say uh, to people at RUSI, look, we, RUSI doesn't have a view on anything. You know, we don't automatically assume that the military ought to be get to get more money. We ought to spend more on the military. We don't automatically have a view on, you know, nu the nuclear deterrent. You can take whatever view you want as independent researchers. But the only thing I insist on is that you have good ideas to back that up and that you've checked your facts. But I will support you as researchers to say anything you want if you've said it on the basis of good research, because that is our, that's, that's what independence is all about. And that there is always a, a sense that, and I used, to, I used to throw my weight against this when I saw it happening, as it tends to do. When you're writing something, you're researching and writing something, you've always got in your mind, even if you're not really aware of it, who the audience is. You can imagine somebody reading it. You can imagine it being read by you know, a, a student or a journalist or whatever. And when people were writing 
with within their mind's eye Whitehall officials if they were trying to please Whitehall officials so that a Whitehall official would read it and say this is very helpful oh yes yeah, very helpful we'll put this on our website you shouldn't do that you shouldn't write it for them you should write it for somebody who isn't a Whitehall official and if the officials like it that's fine but you they are not the audience they're not the target you should write it because it's an honest piece of independent research which you know may or may not be useful to Whitehall but the most use you can be is not is not when you're looking like a PR department for the Ministry of Defence. I mean, the, the Ministry's got its own PR department. So, you know, don't write um, press release style stuff for a, a, a ministry. If they like it, they, that's fine. If they don't like it, tough. I think before we open it up to um, the Q&A, there's, there's one other thing or aspect of, of, of your important career, Mike, which where we coincided as well in this period uh, and, and beyond, which is your 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 crucial role in, in advising and dealing and, and clarifying complexities to to politicians and decision makers and and um, when I was working with the defense committee as as the, the sort of the staffer writing the briefs you you were one of the uh, the, the, the principal advisors who would come in for uh, uh, to, to well to explain things and yeah, it was yeah. always frustrating that my brilliantly written brief uh, <laughs> wouldn't get much reading but 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 your 10 minute summary about about you know what they should care about always was was extraordinarily effective perhaps you could say something about dealing with with the political class if you want to call it that and their advisors I guess that which by which I don't mean you but but the yeah. the, the political the special advisors, the people who will end up going into ministries with these generalists. Yeah, it's it's a bit the same um, as dealing with the media. I mean, media and politicians, although they do very different jobs, have the same basic characteristic, which is that they're focused on the near term. They're focused on you know what's going to happen next week and next month and how they're going to maneuver themselves into whatever the situation might be. Um, and the job of an advisor and indeed, you know, somebody who was doing the sort of job that you were doing is always to try to lift the horizons, not not to convince them not to be short term, but to say, well, if you're if you're thinking about this and this for the next month, be aware that it fits into a broader pattern or it, or it goes against a broader pattern that's been developing over the last two or three years. And so the, the idea of being an advisor in the political realm is if, if you're a political advisor, then you you advise a bit like Malcolm Tucker, you are a advising on the short term you're advising on preferably with with less swearing you're advising on the maneuvers that you need to take but if you're an academic advisor or a policy analyst then your advice is to help people contextualize what they're doing and it's exactly the same when you speak to journalists most journalists are are so geared up to the to the blank page they will face tomorrow morning when they come into the newsroom that um, anything you can tell them um, that is of a, a, a broader perspective, this is the way it's, it's been looking for the last couple of years, is gold dust for them. And that's, that's really where, that's the fun part of it. If you know your stuff, if you're good at what you do and you absorb a lot of information on the way, then you're able, without too much effort, to contextualise for people the things that they're most uh, concerned with. And, I mean, hanging around the, the political world, as you know, is, is fun. I mean, I, I always used to say that, you know, hanging around Parliament, I've been hanging around the bazaars of Whitehall and Westminster now for 20 odd years. And it's a bit like being a piano player in a brothel. Um, you know, you, you, you don't actually take any part in it yourself, but you're somehow complicit with the whole thing. You keep your eyes and your ears open. So there's, there's a degree of complicity, even though you are technically innocent. Um, and there's that, there's that sort of interesting um, sort of relationship that you have with what's going on in Parliament at, uh, uh, you know, within, within the, in the tea rooms in Parliament um, or whatever. I think, I, I mean, I'll just... Uh close by saying I mean that's really interesting Mike and I, and I understand exactly what you're saying of course I, I was going to ask you if there's a, 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 something you wish you 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 had done that you haven't done but, but let me turn it on, on what on your last point do you ever wish that you'd perhaps found yourself in in the position that that um, John Bew now finds himself where where he's not the piano player uh, you know, he's on the stage, uh, and there's no hiding. I mean, the the the, the review, the integrated review. I know he's a professor, and he's semi-detached. But but this this is actually being inside the uh, the, the policy world um, and and guiding it. It's not advising. Yeah, no, and I, I full credit to John Bew because I think what you know what he's doing and what he's done and what he's doing, and we'll see the results when we see finally the integrated review. I think is excellent. Um, it's the sort of thing that happens much more in the States than it does here. 
And um, I welcome the, the fact that it is happening here. I would have loved to have done something like that. I mean, but my, my involvement was always a bit peripheral in that respect, other than um, running the review that I did for the Deputy Prime Minister on the um, internet in the um, Investigatory Powers Act. I ran a two year project on that from Rusi um, and a couple of other things. But uh, by and large, I'm, I'm an advisor who is plugged in on the outside. I've stayed the piano player. Um, but I think the more interaction there is, um, with academics as we're stepping into the policy world and then coming back again. That's healthy as long as the academics are good and John Beale undoubtedly is. Um, I saw this in the States and I saw when it goes wrong is that academics go into the policy world and they're, they're not very good policymakers. And then they come back into the academic world and they're not very good academics either because they've been ruined by power or by the proximity. And I saw that a little bit in Washington in the years that, that I was there. But in general, that doesn't happen because people who are good are good academically and then they're pretty good when they go into the policy world because they're good at what they do and it's it's, it's great to see and I, I wish yeah you know, I wish I'd been young enough to be able to be part of that sort of, of movement which has now uh, been developing in the last 10 years I guess. And I think it's amazing to, to have seen that um, many of our students you know are going into policy jobs and into ministries and, uh, and departments yeah. in a fairly uh, seamless way, yeah. uh, whereas in the past it would have been those established routes of recruitment through the Civil Service Board. Yeah, uh, that's right. And now we seem to have far more avenues for do. Well, I think we should open it up, uh, Mike, if that's all right, uh, with you, you and me reflecting on the good old days um, and, and maybe uh, uh, open up some questions. Charlie, I don't know how you want to uh, organise this now. Perhaps I'll just bring Charlie. Sure. I, I can see that there's um, already a question in the chat, so I think maybe we move to that first. Thomas's question um, was a question to both, uh, both both of you about, as a practical matter, whether you have you seen Kings and Moosey make the greatest um, impact on British government decision making. What what area was that? Mike, do you want to? Start? Yeah, do you want me to go? Um, yeah, the people often ask that, and the the issue is that um, if you tell me what area. You talking about I'll tell you whether we think we made an impact because um, you, you're doing this stuff all the time and a, a lot of it is to do the impact is all connected with time and chance really um, if if government thinks it knows what it's doing uh, on a particular issue and is very determined then what you write is really for the outside world to to help it understand what's happening or help it criticize whatever it might be um, it, there are certain occasions when government really wants some external perspective so at the end of the cold war you know it finished you know cold war comes to an end in 1991 we found ourselves in the early days of the cds at kings doing lots of of uh, meetings with foreign uh, academics and dignitaries because everyone in MOD was reaching out to say, how, how are they thinking in the Baltic states? How are they thinking in Russia? And we were, we know we were having an impact then on just as it were educating the MOD and the foreign office to the, the broader civil societies that were suddenly emerging um, in the former Soviet space then. Um, the, I mean, we had the, uh, uh, the it was a young doctor a medical doctor who became the um, defense minister, I think, of uh, Latvia. Um, and he came to do an MA. He thought, he thought, well, I'm going to be the defense minister. I better, I better do an MA. And so we tried to give him a, a, a crash course in strategy and strategic thinking, which, and he went back to, to become the, the defense minister. It was, it was, it was a, a time of, of tremendous churn, and government was reaching out for um, for ideas and information. Again, I mean, I was involved personally, as, as was Laurie Friedman and uh, four others, it's in the public domain now, about talking to Tony Blair um, on the eve of the real decisions in the Iraq war, it was December uh, 2002, and we had a meeting at Downing Street and talked to him about all of this. Um, and did he take any notice? Well, uh, not really, <laughs> um, but but nevertheless, it was all part of the of the process. And I, you know, and I've 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 I have known and plugged into, uh, apart from David Cameron, all the prime ministers uh, from Tony Blair onwards at various stages. Um, and you you never quite know if what you're saying is making an impression or not, but it's adding to the uh, adding to the to the to, to the background. So, uh, you, you, you know, you can never give a definitive answer to say the government did this because of what we did. The surveillance review that it did in 2013 and 14, I think added, I hope, added to the discussion around the Investigatory Powers Bill. We made some recommendations that were also echoed elsewhere and were taken up. Um, I'm quite pleased that, with the way that worked out. 
those are those are the immediate issues I could imagine or think of. I mean, I'd only add, if I may, that, uh, and it's not supposed to be a cop out at all. I genuinely believe that what what Laurie and you, Mike, and and the rest of us uh, have achieved over the last twenty years is the bringing into um, defence and security thinking, um, academic rigour that that just wasn't there in the same way. It was more policy making, and people people became experts by doing. And there are amazing other visitors who we have in our departments who did it. But the difference is, I do think we've in, we've we've influenced uh, academically, but al but also in, in in asking them to think about policy as something that needs to be based on evidence. Um, uh, as well as politics in a profound way. And I think we've got a generation of, of yeah. not just military leaders, but, but also people in the national security space now who, who, I, th who I think have been helped by the think tanks and, and by Kings and by a few other universities. I don't want to make this too incestuous as mm. we move forward. I, I also think that the, the policy and think tank community and academia were behind, and, and we were part of it, were behind the adoption of a national security uh, yeah. approach, a national security council structure. Uh, and I, and I, I think you, so you can see that as something that, that, that happened. Um, you know, it wasn't inevitable, but it was, it was as a result of lots of different trends. Yeah, I mean, pol politics, and the, you know, the political world goes in f you know, fits and troughs. I mean, when governments are new, when they just come in, they're always very open to ideas. They always reach out because they want ideas to show, partly to show that they listen. When they've been in power for, say, two terms and, are, and things are getting sticky politically, they stop listening because they circle the wagons. And of course, we've seen that in spades, really, since the Brexit vote with both governments. And here we have a government now, you know, with an 80 seat majority that is circling the wagons again. Um, and I hope that won't be, a, be uh, the, the, the story of this whole government, but it is at the moment. So things, you know, there are times when governments are more open than others, but all, at all times, one of the things that think tanks have got to do is to keep good ideas alive, even, in, even when they're not fashionable because there will come a time at which somebody will want something, will reach for something. And so the, the job of think tanks, in a sense, is to keep relevant ideas going, whether governments like them or not, or whether governments think they want them or not. Um, and then to be, you know, what you've got to do as a director of a think tank is you, you've got to have the instinct for when certain areas may be opening up and when there's an opportunity to say something that government will find relevant and useful and will want more of. And that's when you, when you spot something, that's quite exciting. That's great. Questions for Mike, I think. Sorry, Charlie, go ahead. Thank you. No, that's great. I was just going to say there's, there's two questions that um, that sort of follow on from each other, actually, both in, in relation to getting into this world. Mm. One from Philippine about um, the advice for students willing to work in the civil service or as advisors in think tanks, such as the Centre for Defence Studies, what advice you'd give there. And then um, a second question um, for someone who is a, a military person of 30 years standing, is there a well-trodden route into academic and think tank work as a second career or is the market saturated? Um, if so, what can be done while still serving to smooth the transitions? So that's mm. two different routes into this world. Um, do you want to talk about the CDS, John, that that's specifically raised? Um, I mean, I, I can, although I think you've dealt more okay. with, with recruiting people across here. Okay. I mean, I, I think um, I, would, I would say it's horses for courses. A, num a number of my students go straight into ministries and uh, in, into jobs. And I think that's partly, a, you know, it, is a, it is a result of the more specific, especially master's courses that we have. So in a way that they didn't previously do, I think the civil service is more open to people who have studied thematic subject areas that are relevant to the government now. Um, and so, so there is a, a, a slight change in terms of the professionalization. I think the, the question about whether you go into a think tank or government I think comes down to how you think about your career. You certainly can move around, but still being an official within a ministry or a department is different to being in a think tank. And I think you need to ask yourself about, about the nature of, of, of your career aspirations, um, but you certainly can go into both from, from the other, that would be my observation. I mean, my points on this are always that, it, it, again, it depends on, on what, what you're aiming at. If, if you're looking for um, a, a, a fairly long term job in a university um, at the research side or whatever, the chances are that you are going to need a PhD or to be doing a PhD because quite rightly that's 
the basic standard for universities. In the other think tank world, like RUSI or um, uh, you know Rand Europe or PA, uh, some of these um, consultancy organisations that do a lot of good work, you're as good as the last piece of work you did. And so you, you've normally speaking, you've got to have an MA because you've got or master's level because you've got to prove that you can handle research. That's what it's all about: the research degree, but not necessarily a PhD. But then you've got to show that you that you're good at what you do, um, and that you've got something to offer. And so very often, um, if you're a, a student now or a mature student, whatever, you're in the forces, the way to align yourself is first of all, decide, is it is it the more formal university route you want, in which case stay in the formal channels and think about PhD work. If you're going to cast more broadly into the policy world, the analytical world, then it's, it's a question of, first of all, network. I mean, go to things, join, you know, join the, 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 organ the organizations and go to the meetings when, you know, when we can, um, as it were, network quite, quite, uh, uh, as it were, strongly, and then try to write material. There's plenty of outlets these days for material and, and the work that you're doing um, can always be, you know, if you've done a good piece of research on something that can always be reduced or should always be capable of being reduced to 1500 words or 2000 words that can go on websites that can be offered to think tanks. And if, as long as it's based on good work, again, there's no, there's no substitute for quality here. You can't, you can't get away with rubbish or you, you can't disguise rubbish in this world because you're dealing with bright people who know what they're looking for. So it's got to be good, but it's a matter of then of presentation. So networking, writing, um, being able to show that you've got, say, a specialism in, you know, I don't know, counterterrorism or in uh, NATO force structures or uh, military culture or gender in the military, something like that. I mean, whatever it is, you've got to be able to demonstrate it um, and then just network for it. And, you know, being around, as it were, proximity in our world, because it's a fairly small think tank world in London and throughout the UK, um, that goes a long way, actually just being available to be, to, to talk and to chat. And Michael, can I just follow up on that? Because uh, just to mm. ask a, a chair's um, prerogative question, because I don't know how many of uh, my students um, on this or students on other courses where you have to do a, a policy brief style assessment or you, you're writing sort of a short piece. Yeah. Um, what advice would you give for someone? Say it's a, say it's a short piece, you're saying about 1,500, 2,000 words, maybe even shorter than that. Sometimes you find yeah. on Lucy's website, uh, Brookings, uh, places that yeah, uh, yeah. these think tanks have a very sort of succinct concise analysis drawing on excellent research but also doing so in a way that's accessible what, what advice would you give to someone writing a policy brief it's the same advice you give to a good journalist which mm. is say what you're going to say say it and say what you just said mm. um and the, the way it works is the, the the opening paragraph should be the answer to the exam question, whatever it might be, you know, so, so the question is, you know, is Britain right to be uh, sending forces to Mali to, uh, to join the UNISMA, the, the, the UN force there? That's the question. So the, the opening paragraph or the opening statements are, is it a good idea or not? And you say something clear, incisive you might on the fence but you can sit on the fence very incisively you could say this is a good idea but there'll be lots of dangers um, and then the rest of the of the piece the next six or seven hundred words you spell it out three four points as to why that is the case and then in the final bit you go back to the exam question and you uh, as it were restate the answer perhaps with a speculative uh, thing for the future or what what would the next question would be or what the consequences would be and so on it's exactly the way journalists are taught to write. I mean, again, I did a lot of journalism in the early part of my life, one way or another. And the point about journalism is called spiral staircase writing, which is that you start with the main fact, you know, 12 people were killed today when a fire broke through a warehouse. And that is the, that's the basic structure. And everything else work, wends its way around that fact that people have died in a nasty fire. And the reason that you, that you write according to Spiral Staircase in the old days is that a sub-editor would look at the piece that's seven inches long. There's only, five, there's only room for five inches in the paper. So they'd snip off the bottom two inches or the two inches somewhere in the middle and stick the two ends together. And it still made sense because the Spiral Staircase was still there. Now, I'm not saying that, that students should write like journalists. Research is different. But when you convert your research into this sort of briefing, then you've got to think like a journalist because what you're trying to do is answer the question, show why that is the answer to the question, and then say something interesting, which leads people to think, oh, I'd like to read more of what that person says. Mm. 
that's great that's very very helpful um and i, I will get this uh get this this, this link sent to any of the ones who aren't here um can i follow up with another question or just because we we're talking about the um the integrated review and i was wondering if you could say what you think is the sort of you know, this is a a big question but what is the what is the main strategic challenge facing britain today um if, if you were to be yeah if, if just one overarching ahead of anything else um what, what would you say i mean what the integrated review is trying to take on is obviously defining a role that is practical and attainable for britain in the 2020s as brexit britain i mean my point on this has always been that um, the 2020s are going to be a pretty challenging time for all the european countries for all the, the mid-rank countries um including us and brexit just makes it more challenging i mean op offers opportunities as well but it takes the safety net away it means that it's more risky the choice that we take are more risky but the, the single thing that the review has got to try to do is to define a practical um uh, role and something that can be achieved um, within the next sort of 10 to 15 years. And then the falling out from that are all the questions then of, well, how to make the fusion doctrine a reality so that you integrate what government is doing, how to restructure the armed forces so that they skip effectively half a technological generation and jump into the, the 2040s by 2030. Instead of following behind, you know, jump, a, jump half a generation and create differently structured armed forces. That's you know, what the review is all about establishing uh, domestic resilience to a greater level, and we've seen the need for that in the pandemic, uh, making modern deterrence mean something. All of those are the, the things that fall out of the fundamental need to take a really hard look at where Britain is going in the 2030s, 2040s. We would be doing that anyway, but we're doing it even more sensitively because of Brexit and because of the COVID crisis. That's a great thing. And, I, and actually, I can see that we've got a question that follows on from that quite nicely from Rene saying, what are your thoughts on the UK's return to east of Suez and more importantly, its desire to get involved in the Indo-Pacific region? Yeah, um, the, the, the Prince of Wales, uh, sorry, the, the Queen Elizabeth aircraft carrier is on its way as part of a carrier battle group into um, almost certainly the South, South China Sea. It'll go to Singapore and then the, the programme will reveal itself after that. Uh, and it will go into FONOPS, which is a freedom of navigation operations. And the Chinese will laugh at it. They'll say it's the, uh, the knee-jerk reaction of a blown out old imperial power. In reality, they'll absolutely hate it. Um, because it is a it is a challenge, and um, more than that, the the integrated review um, looks as if it will lean towards more activity in what it calls the Indo Pacific. Dominic Ra, the Foreign Secretary, said only last week he said we will incline towards the Indo Pacific, and there's a there's a, a, a an argument for doing that um, because ninety percent of the growth in world trade, not world trade, but the growth of world, in world trade between now and 2030 will be in Asia, 90%. So there's quite a lot to play for. And um, if Britain can reconcile itself to whatever relationship it's gonna to have to the EU and to its European partners, and I hope it'll be a very good and close one, then it makes sense for Britain to be more involved in the Indo-Pacific. And again, I mean, there, there are three, you know, we're in a world of greater protectionism. So there are three enormous trade blocks at the moment. There's the, uh, the, the, the recap trade block, the cooperation economic program, which is a big uh, Pacific one that the Americans basically pulled out of the TPP as was, and the Chinese have now taken it over. That's worth $26 trillion in terms of GDP. There's the North American one, the successor to the old, the, to the old uh, North American NAFTA, which is now the US, Mexico, Canada agreement. That's worth $23 trillion. Um, and then there's the EU single market, which is worth $21 trillion. So there's three big trade uh, organizations out there worth $20 trillion, and we're not in any of them, all right? And we have a, a GDP of just over uh, $2.3 trillion. So they're, they're about eight to 10 times bigger than us and we are sitting on our own. Um, there is a really good argument for trying to integrate ourselves a bit more to at least, if we're not gonna be part of the European single market, then we need to plug in to the recap one because the, the North American one is not open to us. We've, we've taken ourselves out of the single market. So there is only one, the biggest one, that we might plug ourselves into. And then there's the uh, what's called the um, comprehensive and progressive 
Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is a rather strange one, a new one. Uh, we might get into that, uh, and that might make a difference. China is not in that, but Australia is, Canada is, uh, Mexico is, Vietnam is. Um, that's a more strange organization, but we might get in that as well. So there's lots of, of, of reasons to be committed to uh, more Indo-Pacific interests, economically and security terms. But if we're going to do it, we can't dabble. That's the point I'm making. If we're going to do it in a, in a security sense, then it will carry risks. If we're going to do it in an economic sense, then it will change the structure of our economy. So yes, let's do it if that's what the integrator review thinks is the right thing to do. But don't pretend that we can do it without consequences. We mustn't dabble. Strategy, being strategic, means devoting resources to something. It means doing less of something else and more of something, uh, more of one thing and less of something else. It means transferring resources. And strategic choice is about quite big steps this way or that way. So, you know, if that's the step we're going to take, fine. But let's be aware of what we're doing. That's great. Thank you. Um, I can see we've got a couple more questions in relation to, um, to career related um, issues. Um, but obviously, anyone feel free to jump in at any point if they want to answer, ask more questions about the strategic picture as well. But uh, Philippine was just following up and um, saying, uh, the, uh, thank you for your very helpful ask or uh, answer. She is a um, uh, first year P BA and was asking whether some of these things still apply to someone who's um, at the beginning of their career rather than a master's level student in terms of maximizing skills and experiences, internships and writing jobs. And then there's another question to do with regional specialities considered to be an advantage when trying to engage in defence studies or strategic studies in academia and whether think tanks and academic institutions prefer generalists to specialists. So, yeah. yeah. OK, well, the, the second one first, because that's easier. Yes, I mean, uh, specialists rather than generalists. Um, there's, there's lots of good generalists around, but I mean, think tanks are, have all got programs to study this or that and, uh, and uh, very specific programs, because when you're in a when you're running a think tank, you're always um, you're always trying to balance the the subjects that you want to look at that you think are important with what you can get funding for or what somebody's prepared to fund. And so you, you you're always drawn to be very specific about what you want from individual members of staff. Or from new projects. So if you've got a regional specialism, that's very good to have. If you've got language uh, skills uh, within your regional specialism, that's very good to have, uh, as far as think tanks go, in any case. That's certainly true. Um, for um, someone at the, the first year level, and um, you know, I I feel for you having to having to go through your first year in these conditions uh, in university life. Uh, I really uh, I really do hope that these that these uh, constraints fall away pretty quickly and you can enjoy you know, all that universities have to offer. Um, but yes, th to get into research, you, you will need to be at the, at the master's level at some point. Um, but there's a lot you can do as an undergrad in, in internships, for sure. You can still get involved in, um, in network in the sort of networking that I was talking about. You just plug yourself in um, to the, the think tanks that are nearest to what you think you might be interested in or, and you know, plug them into all sorts of other things, too. And remember, it isn't just the think tanks like Rusi or Chatham House or the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Those are the big three. But I mean, there's all sorts of trade associations. So there's ADS, for instance, which is the you know, uh, uh, defense and security and aerospace. Uh, Royal Aeronautical Society, there's the uh, Maritime UK on, on um, all maritime issues, naval and civilian maritime. There's lots of trade associations and they have they have meetings, which some of which are open to the public. And so if you if you've got an area that you think you're interested in or you'd like to get interested in, there's ways of plugging in to the relevant think tanks or places that use people, use analysts and stay connected. And you know, in your undergrad work, you can build up quite a useful portfolio without it. You don't get to get in the way of your undergrad work because you ultimately you want the best grade you can get, but you can build up a portfolio of experience and knowledge um, that is quite useful. I mean, we had a, a, a Rusi, you know, we had a number of uh, interns at undergrad level, a couple of, of actually at sixth form level, who just came back and worked for a few weeks at a time. We never let them do too much because we never wanted to um, to exploit interns. Um, but the, they used to come in and work. And uh, there's one young lady from uh, one of the uh, schools in Ealing um, who's now at uh, University of Surrey. 
um, who may well uh, end up with a job at Rusi when she graduates because she just made herself very useful and was was good at what she did and she she plugged in and, and stuck at it over a three year period and is now doing very well. I think Mike's right. I think you you, um, you know, don't hold back. Get involved. Offer offer to help um, make build relationships. Even though it's a big department, it's a big university. Uh, it still comes down to relationships. Uh, and on the generalist versus uh, uh, regional expert, I'm going to give the uh, the annoying answer, which is that you have to be an expert on something who's capable of being a generalist. By which I mean, as soon as you get into a think tank. Um, the likelihood is you'll be asked to do things completely outside your area of expertise on some occasions, and that's the people who you find most useful yeah. with, with, within a research center, because you, you, the, the core skills of research and communication are transferable. Um, so you, you, you do need both, something you're interested in and you, you excel in, but also the uh, ability to work across, across themes, I think. Mm. At, both at King's and at, at, at Rusi, I established a research, we call them research lunches, where once a week and um, people have just come together for lunchtime, a brown bag lunch in the American style, where you just bring your own lunch together. And we talk about two or three topics that were around, you know, this week it would have been Joe Biden and um, perhaps North Korea and maybe climate change, prospects for the climate change conference or something like that. And we just literally, people, you know, around the table, a couple of people would know quite a lot about it because it'd be part of their area and the others would, would just be interested. And we just go around and just pick each other's brains. It's that liveliness. And, th and they were some of the best meetings, you know, I ever remember. They were such fun. And the last five minutes, we always said it was scurrilous gossip. Anybody heard anything? Anybody heard any interesting gossip from Whitehall? Um, and we just throw in all the rumours we'd heard um, just for fun. And some of them turned out to be true. Some of them weren't. That's yeah. good. PhD okay. question. Can I just say, yep. um, uh, as the PhD is written by you, there's no difference. Um, so you know, the quality of the PhD is exactly the same. Um, I'm sure you may want to add something, but um, uh, it's about the amount of time you do. Clearly, the key difference is it's a longer period and a PhD is a, is a tough thing to do full time and it's a very tough thing to do whilst doing another job. Um, and so you have to be very committed and be able to to maintain that momentum over a period. But the end the product, the, the end result and the support you get from the department is the same whether you do part time or full time. Yes, no, I, I'd, I'd agree completely with that. And um, yes, it's, it's uh, I think the advice I got when I provided my PhD was uh, don't get it right, get it written. And um, I think um, um, obviously, as, as, as has been said, you've got, you've, got to, you've got to know your stuff, but it's, it's about that 90% as well, making sure you can get it done. And as, as John said, um, having the time to be able to do that. Uh, but also, yeah, if, if, you ha if you have a reason to finish it, you'll finish it, whether it's part-time or full-time, I'm sure. Um, just to just to pick up on a couple. I don't know if I should share this, Charlie, but sure. uh, but I shouldn't really. But my <laughs> wife loves to remind me that uh, she completed her PhD part time quicker than I did full time. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's uh, that's that, that's uh, helpful advice to everyone, but also, uh, yeah, uh, what wonderful to hear the uh, the the the, um, the, the scurrilous gossip, as as mm. Michael would, would mm. uh, said. But uh, just to finish up. Um, uh, Sam, um, your question on um, whether it will be on the YouTube channel or on um, uh, it will either be there or will be on our internal intranet, and I'll leave that to uh, to Danielle, and um, uh, we we can uh, we can we can let you know about that. Please tell um, friends about it, and we, we love having um, as many of you here as possible, and also watching these events afterwards. Um, just to just to follow up on uh, just the advice in terms of uh, getting into this world. One thing that I would say is that we have some wonderful. Um, avenues and forums for writing within the department as well. Strife um, is a is a very very good um, uh, journal. The um, our, our undergraduates do some really really great work. So look for opportunities to get involved. Um, people really respect the sort of material that's coming out from our students, and um, so, so look look to write yeah. at every opportunity. Um, but I'll I'll hand to Michael and John see if they have any final comments. Um, but uh, yep, yeah, I'll leave that. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll pass on to you to just, if, if you want to summarise before we uh, before we head off. No, well, I mean, in my final comment, just thanks for this opportunity to chat about the the business and so on. It's not something I, I do a, do a lot of in this context, so it's nice to be able to do that. And I mean, my sense is, you know, when you when you're going through a career. Um, 
you, you want to get a, a reputation for being straightforward and trustworthy. You know, if, if those of you have watched The Apprentice, which I've seen a few times in the dim and distant past, that is a that is a, a model of everything you shouldn't do. Um, all those witless idiots on The Apprentice, they, they do everything exactly wrongly. Um, you should do the exact opposite to what they do. So it's the idea of being be straightforward, be trustworthy, take your boss solutions, not problems. Um, and be good in a crisis, be cool, keep your head in a crisis. And if, if you're good at what you do, if you do a common thing uncommonly well, the senior people will notice, believe me, they do. I mean, I've been a senior person long enough. Do a common thing uncommonly well, we notice. And uh, equally, if somebody you know makes a mess of something, it's pretty easy, we notice that too. So common thing uncommonly well, be trustworthy. Yeah, and I think, well, Mike, that's great advice. I, I would just uh, go back to something um, we were saying before about when you set up CDS and the decision to come wasn't difficult for you. Um, I think you you need to think about what you, you what you're comfortable with as an individual. And for some people, they they prefer a structured career, uh, which is very straightforward. And for others, I mean, everyone's got the capacity to, for entrepreneurship. But I would say think tanks are quite entrepreneurial uh, activities where you have to find the, the, the next the next project, the, ne the next yeah. funder. Uh, it's very dynamic, it's very stimulating, um, but, it's, but it, 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 there's an element of insecurity to it uh, and, and not, not everybody is comfortable with that. And also you have to hustle um, as, a, as a staff member and also as the leadership. And if that appeals to you, I, I'm, I'm sure you'll find it stimulating and exciting. But for some people, they would rather understand and know what they have to do um, and do excellent work. And that, that would then suggest a more mainstream academic approach, perhaps, or even the civil service. I mean, I think that, some are, that to me encapsulates the difference, perhaps. That's great. Thank you so much, John and Michael, for a really great discussion, some really wonderful advice. And thank you to all of you for, for attending and some excellent questions. And we look forward to seeing you back here for the next conversation and strategy with in a couple of weeks time. So just keep a lookout for that and take care, um, stay safe and we look forward to seeing, seeing you soon. Thanks, Mike. Thank Thanks, you. Bye-bye.